comes out week after week. And he has agreed to join us today to share some things with you. So I thank you very much, Elliot. You are so welcome. We are so honored to have you. Uh, and I'm going to give you the floor. Oh, I think there's an echo. Is it all oh. right? No, that was, a, that was a flattering introduction, Grace. Thank you so much. <laughs> It's, it's lovely to, to meet you all today. Uh, my name's Elliot Reed, and, and yeah, my I suppose primary business is the Revitalized Clinic. We're an award-winning clinic where we've provided over 7,000 people with uh, services that improve their physical health, their mental health, their fitness, and get them out of pain. And um, my other project is blackhistory.school, which is where I'm educating um, schools and individuals on our history. And the reason why I'm doing that is because history provides concepts. Concepts are ways that we view ourselves and the way that people view other people, or it provides framework for that, we might say. For example, there's a reason why the British will, in the, in the national curriculum, will teach about World War II, because that provides a concept that they want, but they won't teach about empire, because that provides a concept that they don't really want. So then I suppose the, the next question is, is why was I interested in history? Why was I interested in learning about our history to provide myself a concept for how I view myself? And there's a few reasons for that. I grew up in, in Kent. I've grown up in Kent where it's not very diverse or at least it is, it is now, but it wasn't historically very diverse. And also my, my dad of Jamaican descent grew up in foster care. So his connection to Jamaica was cut off for a certain part of his life. And I didn't grow up with my dad in the home. So my connection to my dad was cut off for say five, six days a week when I was growing up. So essentially I was, I was by myself in a very undiverse area. Multiple problems arise. I was first called the N-word when I was eight years old. By the time I was 15 or 16, I was dragged out of parties twice by people to give me a kick in just based on the way that I look or for my, my ethnic background. I've had people not want to sit next to me on, uh, tr on planes. I've had people um, want to run me over in their cars whilst I was riding my bike when I was a child, you know, using uh, um, racial... Uh, racial insults to insult me as they tried to do it and and then you know, at, even at school within the first few weeks of being at school people my, my phone number was passed around the school of, around the class and I was being sent pictures of monkeys and texts with people calling me a monkey and stuff like that so that forced me two options I could either accept the concept that other people have of me or I had to look a bit deeper to find truth and both have their challenges. When it comes to our people, say people of the West African diaspora or people of, of Caribbean descent, our culture is so popularized that a lot of the time our concepts are out of our control in the sense that we can have media representations of us that aren't necessarily and aren't often representative of who we actually are we might see an overrepresentation of a criminal concept, of an over-sexualized concept, which doesn't necessarily relate to who we are. But then you have the challenge of going into history and trying to find truth. Now, when it comes to the popular history of say the West African diaspora or of uh, people of Caribbean descent, the popularized history is one of pacificity, i.e. you kind of sat down and took it for three to 400 years, and then lucky for you, the same person who caused your enslavement eventually set you free. And you should be thankful for them, whether that's for Abraham Lincoln or William Wilberforce or uh, William Nib, whoever you want, right? So you're initially confronted with this pseudo history, which you then have to go deeper into or deeper past. However, when you do go deeper past this, I assure you that our history is full of the most colorful, interesting, triumphant, victorious, brave individuals that you will ever read about in your life. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about this. 
All right, now let's go first of all back to around, and I'm gonna go through this within the next say 20 to 30 minutes. Please uh, ask any questions that you have along the way. Um, please ask me any questions. Yeah, just feel free to, to interrupt me at any point. But 7,600 years ago, we have most, most civilization at this time was around the Horn of Africa. So Northeast Africa, East Africa, and uh, the Middle East. But the civilization, they weren't quite civilizations yet. Might call them townships. Now, an individual called King Nama comes from the Sudan. And he marches into Egypt with his people. And he starts to change a few things. He builds up the banks of the Nile to start to enable the Nile to flood in a predictable way. He then uses the land around for farmland. Under ancient Egyptian rule, he, um, King Nama and his descendants were able to feed more people per square acre of land than ever before. This means that these individuals were then able to rather than become, they were able to stop being so nomadic and actually set down roots. They had more time to specialize, to hone their arts, to become farmers, architects, builders, scientists. And we see at this point in time, the first myths start to occur. The first myths are put to, to, uh, to, to written form in obviously hier hieroglyphics. And we start to see religions which very much resemble the uh, monolithic re re religions or the Abrahamic religions that are still in use today. So a fantastic example, I think, is the Ten Commandments, right? So Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, steal, commit adultery, etc. Now, interestingly enough, if we look to the ancient Egyptian religions, we have something called the Declaration of Innocence. And the Declaration of Innocence is actually a list of, I think it's 42. Yeah. It's a list of 42 declarations as to what the pharaohs um, would prescribe to, ethics that the pharaohs would prescribe to. I'll read a few of them out. Um, I have not transgressed the law. I have not terrorized the zone. I have not polluted myself. Um, I have not debauched the wife of any man. I have not slandered anyone. I have not attacked any man. I have not eaten the heart. I have not committed adultery. I have not carried away food. And we also have these uh, instances of individuals sacrificing themselves for the greater good of humanity to bring balance. So one might be the myth of Horus, for example, who did that, or how Horus goes to battle with his evil uncle Set um, to bring light to the world. So we start to see these, these early myths, which essentially lay the foundations of the stories for stories which are still reiterated today. But not just, I mean, ancient Egypt didn't just provide a foundation for us ethically, it also provided a foundation for us when it comes to our architectural works. I'll put it into to, to, uh, to perspective. So this time in history provided huge, huge architectural developments. You're talking about the um, pyramids, which up until I think the Renaissance era, era, or maybe like two, three hundred years ago, was still the tallest buildings in the planet, which were built by um, Pharaoh Kumu. Kum I have to look it up, um, but this is like three thousand years BC. Now, these pyramids integrated so four hundred eighty foot tall, and they integrated Pythagoras's theorem a thousand years before Pythagoras. They correlated to the north, east, south, west poles. The Thurban, uh, the Thurban, which was their north, which was their pole star at the time, Orion's belt, pi, the Earth's circumference, all of these calculations were integrated into the development of the pyramids. We've also got the uh, Temple of Karnak, which was built four thousand years ago, but it could fit the it could fit the uh, Cathedral of Notre Dame just into one of his entrance halls. That's how big it was. And so, what we're seeing here is. North Africans or Northeast Africans, Black Africans, who essentially laid not just the, the first civilization of all time, but did so in dramatic fashion, in a fashion which is still not replicated even today. Now, 
these religions and these civilizations also provided almost, I suppose, uh, a brain leak or provided a foundation for further development and uh, further contributions to other areas across Africa. A lot of the myths and the methods and the philosophy which we see in ancient Egypt didn't just pass into Abrahamic religions, but also passed into some of the early West African religions our ancestors would have um, partaken in. Now, when it comes to the, I suppose, the next boom of, of African history or the next boom of African contribution, it was quite steady from 7,600 years ago, all the way up until about 500 years ago, where we start to see Timbuktu or the frameworks of um, the Songhai and the Asante and ancient Ghana um, and, uh, and ancient Mali start to be formed in West Africa at the time. Now, here we start to see, you know, you might say 500 years, about 500 to 700 years after the fall of ancient Egypt under the Romans, we start to see huge contributions by African people to the development of intellect, philosophy, the sciences. So you feel free to share images with the group. Okay, what I might be able to do actually, let's see, can I share my screen? Is that possible? Yes, you can. At the bottom it says share screen, you should be able to. Ah, okay, perfect. Okay, awesome. Right, I'll share my screen. All right, cool. So let's go through this a bit more methodologically then. All right. So after the fall of um, the Roman Empire, um, which was the main source of civilization and order within Europe, we enter the Dark Ages. Now, the Dark Ages were essentially a period of time where nothing much was written down and widespread chaos occurred. One way to think of the Dark Ages in Europe would be um, to think of, you know, imagine what would happen if at school your teacher left the classroom for five minutes and there was no one there to kind of occupy you. Then imagine what would happen if they left for 30 minutes, an hour, two hours. Then imagine if someone threw a football in the middle of the room, right? You start to see widespread chaos start to erupt throughout the classroom. And that's essentially what was happening in Europe at the time. There was very little order. There was barbarism. There were a lot of um, uh, savage acts of savagery, cannibalism. There was not much order at all. Now, at the same time as this, we actually started to enter Africa's, West Africa's golden age. So at the same time as there being murder, famine, capitalism, tribal feuds in Europe, we start to see the formation of ancient Ghana. We start to see the Yoruba tribes uh, and ancient Mali and Benin. These individuals, the legend says, came from the Northeast and they traveled southwestwardly into West Africa. They carried advanced farming techniques, trade links, they started to farm <clears throat> palm oil, yams, palm wine, and they started to spread our trade via um, the old trade routes with other Islamic territories and non-Islamic territories as well. We see huge amounts of wealth accumulated during this time, not just by trade, but also via books. In Islam um, and a lot of the West African uh, kingdoms at this time, were, were uh, practicing Muslims. In Islam, education is extremely important. Muhammad said, seek knowledge, and they, and they sought knowledge. And they started to dedicate, dedicate huge amounts of time into <clears throat> astronomy, science, literature, architecture. And at this time, books were actually traded at a higher cost than gold. And there's a few reasons for this. Think of now, we can go on our phone, and we can access huge amounts of information within seconds, right? There was no printing press back here, back then. So you couldn't easily replicate literature or books. You had to go where the knowledge was. And if you wanted to take that knowledge away, it came with a cost, which is why books were so expensive back then. Now, we then see in the 14th century, as these West African empires have developed, huge investment in nautical exploration. In Songhai, Mansa uh, Abubakari, in the 14th century, sent 
four, sorry, 2,000 ships westwardly to the, um, to the Americas. And this was what, about 200, 200 plus years, almost 300 years before Christopher Columbus. And just to put this into perspective, there have been individuals who have broken records by rowing across the Atlantic Ocean to visit America in a canoe boat. So we can be quite assured that some of these 2000 ships got to the Americas. And later, uh, via exploration, we found African spears, African canoes, American villages, Malian names such as the Mandinga port, Mandinga Bay, Sierra de Mali uh, were also discovered. And two African skeletons were also found in the Danish islands, which date back to about 1250 AD. So we can be quite rest assured that our West African ancestors had knowledge of the Americas for quite a while before the Europeans did. I think Kwasi may have a question. Oh yeah, go for it. Kwasi, unmute yourself. Okay. Um, so I had so my question was, um, since books were considered valuable at the time and they were more expensive than gold, would education not has been not have been as common back then as it is now? Ah, uh, so this is the less so less um put this into perspective because I think this is a really interesting, really interesting point. Yeah, absolutely. Education would have been harder to come by back then and literacy rates would have been lower. But when we look at um, West Africa in comparison to the rest of the world at the time, because in Islam, you're encouraged to be able to read the Quran. Um, so you're encouraged to be able to read and write Arabic. If we contrast this to what was happening in Europe at the time, in Europe at the time under a Christian rule, the Bibles were written in Latin and only certain classes of people, so the upper echelons of society, were educated in being able to read and write Latin or read and write in general. So we see much higher literacy rates in West Africa at the time, much higher rates of education than other areas of, of the world. Um, so education was very much encouraged, whereas other areas, it might have been more discouraged. Does that answer your question, Laura? Yeah, thank you. No problem. Just to give you um, uh, some perspective as well, at this time in Timbuktu, so Timbuktu had a university called Sankor, and in the Sankor University, there were more people being educated in Sankor University than the entire population of London at the time. So that will give you some, um, that will enable you to compare the uh, rates of education in um, West Africa or some areas of West Africa versus say the, the UK or England at the time. So yeah, like I said, there were more people in education in Sankal University than the entire population of London. And there are still 700,000 books that are still in circulation today. There are South African establishments which are actually currently translating them um, into English. Or, and it, it, so we can um, understand them. And these books are actually available even on Kindle at the moment. Now, because of the investment in infrastructure, the uh, investment in finance and in gold and literature, Mansa Musa, who is the brother of uh, Abu Bakari, became the richest man that had ever existed. And he's still today the richest man that's ever lived when it comes to um, uh, when, it, when we adjust for inflation. So we can see this man here holding a, a golden nugget with a gold crown. This is Mansa Musa. This is in a, a Portuguese map that was circulated uh, in Europe around the time depicting West Africans or the West African king as being obviously a, a very wealthy man holding a nugget of gold. Unfortunately, however, this spread news to the rest of the world about, so to Europe and to the Middle East, about the wealth which laid in Africa. Um, and later down the line, under the, after the death of Mansa Musa, Songhai was segmented from power struggles uh, between the sons of Mansa Musa, and we start to see a division occur at the time. Now, we're now just going to um, cover the Moors, which were a North African empire um, which hugely contributed to the development of Europe. So like I said, during the life of the Prophet Muhammad, Muhammad instructed his followers to seek knowledge, but he also forbid Muslims for going into combat with other Muslims. 
So they started to spread westwardly and they eventually came to Egypt where this old, these old bases of literature in the Alexandra, great library of Alexandria was, and they extracted the Greek classics, um, ancient Egyptian philosophy, and as well as at the Bible, and they translated them into Arabic, and they then absorbed the knowledge into their organizations and into their empire. They eventually got to Morocco. Morocco is Northwest Africa, and it lies at the tip of Southern Spain. And we then see a man called Tariq ibn Zayed uh, sail across the water and he successfully invades Spain in the seventh century AD. And rightly so, egotistically so, he uh, names the, the area that he named, the, he names the area where he landed after himself, um, which is why we have the area called Gibraltar today, which translates into or old, in old and Arabic that would have translated into Rock of Tariq. Now, the Muslims, the Muslim Moors then started as they were blending with Berbers, Arabs and Sub-Saharan Africans. We start to see them introduce many features which we still enjoy today into Europe. They lifted Europe out of the Dark Ages. They provided religion. So Spain was, was, um, was, would be classed as a Muslim country for 800 years. They introduced trade. The, the Moors, so this African empire is the reason why we use Indian numerals and an Indian mathematical system rather than Roman numerals today. So the reason why we count from zero to nine is because this African empire introduced these numerals into Europe. They massively influenced our, our mathematical system, our architecture, and even our fashion. There's a, a man called um, Ziryab, which translates into black blackbird. And he was a very eccentric individual, a very intelligent individual. He'd probably be classed today as a polymath, so a person who was gifted uh, many different uh, disciplines. And he introduced such things such as fine dining, having different clothes for different seasons. He introduced um, drinking out of glasses rather than or, or, rather than drinking out of uh, crystal glasses rather than out of chalices. We start to see the guitar introduced into Europe. And we also start to see chess, even our language is influenced. So words like alcohol, alcohol, alchemy and algorithm are from the Moors. And the study of astronomy was massively enhanced by these, the, this Muslim African empire because they had to uh, navigate at night because it was too warm to travel during the day. So they would use the stars to navigate, but also they had to pray eastwardly towards Mecca. So they had to use stars to navigate uh, themselves or to orientate themselves towards Mecca. Now, eventually we see the Moors downfall. They were fragmented and the Christian Visigoths who were in uh, Spain at the time then start to push the uh, Moors out of Europe and they forced Muslims and Jews either to convert or to go back to Africa or into to Morocco, which is where we see uh, many descendants of these uh, Spanish Muslims and Spanish Jews today. However, there was one town in Spain which was left untouched and that was Toledo. And in this town, there were many books, many forms of, of literature, which were extremely educational. And the Christians then started to absorb these, this educational material into their own framework and into their philosophy and into their organizations. And arguably this sparked the Renaissance, which is um, what essentially gifted Europe with an age of enlightenment, where they were more focused on education, organization and innovation. However, Africa's golden age was unfortunately start to, become, start to come to an end. In 1492, we have Christopher Columbus discovering America, which we'll call, say, discovering America, traveling to America, discovering it for the Europeans and introducing America to the Europeans for the first time. And in 1578, we see the Moroccan Sultan ally with, the Queen, with Queen Elizabeth I, and they ally using their own uh, sources of uh, bombardment, so their cannons and their artillery to sack Songhai, which was a very large, very successful West African empire at the time. However, at this time they were outgunned. 
Now, this is where we start to see a part of history that we're more familiar with. We have a few things going on. England is unfortunately going through a period of empire envy, where it's jealous of the Spanish uh, acquisition of gold and land in the Americas. We start to see pirates, English pirates, like, for example, Captain Morgan and Captain John Hawkins raiding Spanish ships for their gold. They then use this, they then take this gold back to England. The monarchy is impressed and the monarchy start to invest in these pirates. They legalize them. They call them privateers. And these pirates then start to commit also to the slave trade, which the Spanish are um, already involved in. So at this time we see English pirates extracting gold, um, stealing gold from the Spanish. They then use this gold to buy up land, for example, in Jamaica, which is where Captain Morgan, you might know Captain Morgan from the rum, Captain Morgan's rum. He then, they then use this gold to buy land in the Americas and to also buy slaves from West Africa. Now at this time, West Africa had an existing slave economy, but it was very, very different to what the Europeans uh, the European form of slavery. For example, you had neighboring tribes. One tribe would battle another tribe. That tribe would then absorb prisoners of war into the community. Those prisoners of war would have a temporary status of slavery. They could work their way up through slavery, marry their way out of slavery, or buy their way out of slavery. <clears throat> but for example, in the Yoruba, so the Yoruba people who tend to live in uh, Nigeria today, um, they had a strict code of conduct as to how they had to treat their slaves. And they were essentially uh, almost an extended member of the family. They could then be absorbed into the tribe and they had to be treated fairly. Otherwise, the individual who overlooked the slave would be punished. The Europeans took, the, took advantage of this existing setup and they essentially started to create an arms race. They had, for example, two neighboring tribes the pirates or the merchants would trade guns with one of the tribes and say to one tribe that if you now invade the other tribe, if you extract prisoners of war from that tribe, we'll then buy those prisoners of war off of you with more guns or gold or any goods that the Europeans had that the Africans valued. This heavily fragmented fragmented West Africa, it made it very, very difficult for any advancement, technological, structural advancements to be made over the next three to 500 years. We normally see this during wartime. So for example, um, in Western Europe during World War II, there was a halting of any developments. And then we then see economic booms after um, the war ends in Europe, and that was mainly based on their financial system and their ability to, to borrow enough money to do so. But we see essentially an underdevelopment of Africa happen at this time. Many tribes have to up and leave their home locations. Many traveled, tra traveled southerly, which is why ancient Ghana and Ghana are in two different places today. We see individuals also in West Africa start to have hugely in some cases hugely triumphant battles against the Europeans to fight off the the slave trade and we also see individuals who are having to leave the home and set their homes up and huge groups of people who are having to set the homes up in more advantageous or more easily defensible areas for example there's a certain tribe in West Africa today who built their town on water so it was harder for slave catchers or neighboring tribes to to come and uh, take their people away from them we also see individuals who move up into the mountains or into more desert areas, so they're e more easily defended. And the difference was that between the European and the African, I suppose, philosophy of slavery is that the Europeans had a racial view of slavery rather than a status view of slavery. I.e., if you're a black, if you're black, then you're a slave. The more black you are, the more inferior you are, and um, they. They promoted this philosophy so much though that you then start to see them using a science, not even scientific, they start to see use religious and scientific means of uh, justifying their actions, um, basically, basically creating this, this false philosophy that Africans are not full human beings. As the slave trade starts to 
pick up pace, we start to see anywhere between 10 to 20 million Africans taken from West Africa to the Americas. About a third of them die on the way there because of such harsh conditions. We can see how tightly packed these individuals were here. And it's very important that we acknowledge that these aren't, these aren't nameless, identifierless people that are being taken. These are fathers, mothers, scientists, architects, teachers, builders, farmers. These are real people with real lives. They had their name and their body and their religion taken away from them. We see brutal, absolutely brutal uh, forms of torture um, partaken in this time. The conditions were so harsh that the average life expectancy for an African, say, arriving in the Caribbean, say Jamaica, was only seven years. And the average age of the captors, captives was uh, 15. So an individual on average would get off the slave ship age 15 and they would die by the time that they were 22. But what's one, one thing that we have to really remember is, and it goes, it, it strikes on something that I spoke about earlier about the pacificity of Africans at this time. It was not a passive experience for them. About 10% or one in 10 slave ships revolted against the, the, uh, against the slave captures. Some of them successfully so, some of them being able to maneuver the ships back to safe territory, others unfortunately didn't. Slave rebellions were a very regular occurrence. And at the same time, we see this culture of hedonism, i.e. pleasure seeking, start to take over in the Americans, in the Americas. Now, this is unfortunately where, because the merchant classes had all of the control in the Americas, there was very little ethical obligation for them, if at all. I don't know if many of you have read the book, for example, um, House of the Flies, about a group of children who are shipwrecked on an island and without any law or any uh, overseeing of their morality or their ethics, it's absolute bedlam. And that's essentially what happened in Jamaica uh, specifically. It's a very, very good book called Island on Fire, I think is written by Thomas Sorwell. And it's about the um, Baptist, Baptist War in Jamaica in 1831. And he describes the island as an island of hedonism, where individuals would, these, these merchant classes, these slave owners, would be extremely unhealthy, swollen guts, swollen faces, faces full of acne, skinny arms, skinny legs, where they're essentially wasting away. They drink rum all day. They, they beat, they kill, they torture. And we start to see just the, the most abhorrent evil acts of mankind that I've ever read about. I think you're, you might be a bit too young for me to disclose what actually happened, um, but I'll leave that to the, the, um, to, to the, I'll leave that to the decision of, of, of you guys who are, who are hosting today. Now, what we start to see as the Africans start to unify, because as the Africans are being taken to the Americas, they come from many different tribes, many, they speak many different languages. But as time goes on, they start to unify and they start to revolt and the revolts become a lot more successful. This brings us on to the most successful revol revolts. One of the most successful revolts was the Haitian Revolution. Now this was um, headed by this man here, Toussaint Louverture. Now he, was essentially, he was a very successful, very well-educated businessman who had freed himself by the age of 30 in Haiti, which is a French slave colony. And we at this time see the ceremony, the Bois Caymon ceremony, where two individuals, Dutty Bookman, who was a, a Gambian Islamic scholar for, uh, from Gambia, who was enslaved and taken to Jamaica. He was then taken to Haiti himself and another, um, another lady, Cecil Fatima, who was the descendant of a slave woman and uh, evidently a, an Italian prince. They unite together and they unite the African slaves on Haiti around the ceremony. And we see Dutty Bookman give a very powerful prayer and speech. And they incite the Africans to revolt and take their freedom. The, if you have time to look up the speech, it's, it's amazing uh, what he said at this time. Toussaint Louverture was arguably in, in, was evidentially in attendance or he heard about this ceremony. He viewed himself as the black messiah 
that they spoke about in the ceremony. He identified as the Black Messiah and he charged himself with the duty of freeing the Africans on Haiti from slavery. He, can, he created an army, about 30% of them were women, many of them mixed race. He, in battle, was seriously wounded 17 times. He was extremely honorable. He often escorted uh, French, so white refugees, out of war zones. He used very advanced guerrilla tactics. He defeated the French, the British, the Spanish, and Napoleon Bonaparte himself. Napoleon Bonaparte is thought of as one of the most genius military minds of Europe. Toussaint Louverture successfully defeated him. And at this, we then start to see the development of the first, that is the first incident, it's the first time in history where a slave population has defeated their, cap, their captures, defeated those people who are oppressing them, and have set up a democracy in its place. And that was set up by Jean-Jacques Dessalines, who was a, uh, a fellow general of Toussaint Louverture. The Caribbean at this time was, and it obviously still is, but at this time it was extremely well connected. There were boats going back and forth from every Caribbean island. The Jamaicans heard about this. Toussaint Louverture himself even aimed to free the, the Jamaican slaves um, at the time that he was in power. And unfortunately, he was catch, captured by the French. He was kidnapped by the French and he was sent to Eastern France where he died of pneumonia in, the dun, in, a, in a tower. But he wrote um, letters to, and he, he, he created um, strategies to liberate the Jamaican slaves from slavery once he had done so on the island of Haiti and also uh, Dominica today. So in 1831, we see Samuel Sharp, who was a Baptist minister, who without a doubt would have heard of the Haitian revolution. And he starts to speak to his following. And he does something a little bit naughty, but something that would pay off the next, the, 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 eventually. He told the Africans living on Jamaica that <clears throat> they'd already been freed by the king and that the slave owners were hiding it for them, from them. He then organized them in a, in a, in a very, very uh, sophisticated manner to burn plantations, to take up high ground and um, to rally themselves to fight their oppressors. He had around 60,000 followers who marched against the British, mainly using acts of disobedience, but also killing slave owners and uh, freeing other slaves. Eventually he was captured and he, one of his, some of his last words were, I would rather die upon yonder gallows than live in slavery. Less than a year later, um, slavery is abolished in Jamaica. Now, there'd be a lot of people who argue that, <clears throat> there's, there'll be a lot of people who argue that the reason why Africans are free today or that Afro-Caribbeans, West Africans are free today was because of the permission granted to them by a uh, government, so by parliament at the time, for example, right? I'll put something into perspective. 1831, there was absolutely no sign of slavery slowing down. It was at its height. Yes, there was some competition from Brazil. Um, Brazilian plantations were producing sugar at a far cheaper price, making slavery or, or the production of sugar in the Caribbean less profitable. But at this time, around 75% of British MPs in parliament had money invested in the Caribbean. It was very much against their interest to abolish slavery. The reason why our ancestors were freed was because of people like Queen Nanny, Samuel Sharp, Toussaint Louverture, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and their following. This spirit of freedom fighting and emancipation carried on into the 20th century. Now, when World War II was over and the British were crying out for help to the Commonwealth, the people who took up that call were many of our grandparents who came here in say the 1950s and the 1960s. Now let's just put one thing into perspective. When the British appealed to the Commonwealth for help, they were not appealing to those of darker complexion. They were appealing to the Australians, the Canadians, even the Americans to come to the UK to help them. They didn't answer, we did. And by the time that we arrived, 
there were already partitions. So before uh, Windrush even docked in Tilbury, there were already partitions to send our grandparents home. So it's just, just to put into perspective, there's there's a bit of a, a, a pseudo history that likes that's you know commonly told that um, we were the good ones, we were wanted. It's not the case. You know, there's a lot of people who are very anti-immigrant today who will say, yeah, but you're not integrated. These guys aren't. It was a huge struggle, a huge struggle for our family when they first came here to integrate. There were, there were race riots. There were many individuals who lost their lives. We see the, um, the New Cross fires. Uh, we see the Brixton riots where individuals were seriously hurt or killed purely because of their race. Now, the reason why I think history is important is there might be a, a few things that were covered today that you might not have known about our people and where we come from and who we are and how brave we've been, how smart we've been, how creative we've been, how, uh, how strong a visionary force we have been. And it's very, very important that we hold on to these concepts because these concepts are the truth there are other concepts around that we are other than this, that we kick up a fuss about nothing, that we've got a chip on our shoulder, that we are, you know, read off the list, whatever you want to call it. The concept, the true concept is the concept which I've given today, that we descend from an extremely brave, triumphant, creative, forward thinking people. And it's very, very important that we hold on to this. There will be countless moments throughout your lives, hopefully lessening so, or to a lesser amount so, that I might have experienced, where someone will be a, will try and tell you who you are or give an impression of who you are based on their perception of what you look like and what you look like represents to them. Make sure you hold on to your truth, the true truth that of who we are and who we descend from. Um, I hope that my talk has been valuable to you today. I have my own thoughts on how we should proceed as a community and as a people but I'll be interested in hearing your thoughts about what I've discussed and and obviously um, any questions that you have as well thank you for listening wow I'm blown away um I don't know if you can hear me yeah I can hear you fine oh fantastic that was a powerful narration of history thank you I am speechless to be quite honest <laughs> I mean a lot of this obviously I've been doing my research over the years but to hear from the beginning of time <laughs> what black people have contributed it's what they have experienced what they have been through and for you to narrate it step by step it has been phenomenal and so Thank I'm you. very grateful that you came and have shared this with us today um it's a history young people don't you agree we just do not hear within our school systems. It's an untold history. And just hearing uh, Elliot speak today, I hope it ignites in you your true spirit of excellence. Really, we are amazing people. Um, does anybody have any questions? I, I really don't wanna talk too much. I just wanna open the floor and give you all an opportunity to ask questions or share. So do put your hand up, use this opportunity now to ask Elliot any questions that you have for him. For him. Wow, we're all quiet today. Wow, <laughs> fantastic. I think I'm going to start with Kwasi and then we'll go to Nima. So, so Kwasi, um, my question was, if there were to be any traces of slavery nowadays, um, would the government, if the if um, that evidence came to lie of the government and the police, um, would the person who is being captured be freed and released from captivity? Yeah, so just the... Just the clarify Kozzi that you're asking um if slavery was to be attempted today would it would it be classed as illegal is that right yeah okay it's technically yes but um and this is a bit of a of a of, a, of a, another question another course of conversation that because we have a free market 
um, essentially whatever makes money goes, right? Now that means that the people, for example, can invest in overseas ventures that encourage slavery um, or some form of slavery, um, but they're not made accountable by British law. So an example would be, for example, if I invest in Apple, um, Apple might then use that money to increase their, um, their mining of minerals which are used in their phones. Now, when they uh, mine those, uh, when they mine those minerals for use in their phones, they're paying people so little in, say, like, so I think it's Uganda, that um, it's basically slavery, and the the conditions that they live in are are really poor, right? Now, this is a bit different because you then have the well, no, you have the same question as to what do you do? Do you um, eradicate the um, do you eradicate that system, but then eradicate their work. One, one answer proposed by um, Mark Carney, who's the old bank of the, uh, the old government of the governor of the Bank of England, is that we have to entwine ethics with the economy. There has to be an ethical or moral backbone to or structure to how people make money. Um, so to come back to your question, that unfortunately because we have a free market, money talks. As long as something makes money, a lot of the time it can, it can be, it, it can go forward. Um, but also, just a reminder that slavery was never actually legalized in Britain. Uh, that's why the individuals, for example, like Frederick Douglass or uh, Equiano Alaudo, who were, were both very, very successful anti-slavery um, uh, campaigners, they made a home for themselves in Britain because they were safe in Britain. Um, so yeah, so slavery has never been legal to in, in the UK, um, but it doesn't mean that bad things can't happen. Thank you so much for that. Moving on to Nima, there's quite a few questions. So I'm going to allow people sure. to just ask the questions and if you could, if you're able to touch on it briefly. Of course. So Nima, what's your question? Yeah, uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much. That that was incredible. Like the wealth of information that was there was just mind blowing but I kind of wanted to ask in terms of you know like your childhood and the way that people perceived you and the way that you were treated mm. how did you move from that kind of um mental I don't know like that kind of um environment and yeah. the, the mental impact that had to moving into this space where you were able to kind of um you know discover your roots or discover your history like how did you I think essentially what I'm asking, like, how did you make that kind of like um, mental step from, I, I hope my question is making sense, but oh, like yeah. how, how did you move from that space of kind of being looked down upon, to be honest, to, you know, making the decision that like, yeah, I'm going to discover who I am by like reading up history. Like, how did you come about? To be honest, um, I, had, I had no choice, right? Mm. It was, I, can't, I can't sit there and uh, kind of marinate myself in this just awful concept that other people have of me. Like it, it just wouldn't fit well with my esteem. I had no choice. I either, I either sit there and um, have this perception that I can't live with mm. or I do something about it. So it was my natural curiosity which led me. Um, I was a huge fan of Muhammad Ali. Muhammad yeah. Ali then led me to Malcolm X. Malcolm X then led me to um, other activists or other, and I, the, the biggest thing for me with Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali and also, most Af most leaders of the West African diaspora is it's the it's the tongue which does is the most powerful. It's their ability to put their thoughts to word or their thoughts to speech, which was the most powerful thing. Mm. I came across then um, an individual called uh, Robin Walker who does a, a free um, African history course in Croydon, and I took his course, and then that just opened up a huge box for me to to dive into, and I just absorbed absorb the history because the history for me was like medicine it really helped me to correct uh, yeah. my 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 view of myself mm -hmm. yeah okay thank you so much Pleasure. That's on mute. sorry i love that the history for me was like medicine and i want to just before i go on to the next question it brings me back children to something that sarah connor asked residential historian taught at the very beginning about a quote Michael Holden once said about history being taught by those in power, not by the victims or those who, are who have suffered. So just hold on to that thought. 
But on that note, let's go to Nikel. Nikel, you have a question for Elliot. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? What did your interest start with Black History? Sorry, say that again? What age did you start oh. learning more about Black History? So I remember when I was eight years old, I was, um, like I said, I was called um, an N-word for the first time. Um, I went to my dad's that weekend and I, I remember it so clearly. I don't know if you guys have played Risk before, but Risk is a, is a map, right, on Risk. And um, my dad is very, very smart. Uh, it, my dad is a detective, my, or used to be a detective. My dad was um, one of the, the lead detectives in, um, in prison in the murderers of Stephen Lawrence. So he's very, very good at extracting information. So we sat down with this map and he said, well, he said, just let you know, Elliot, he said, because he's trying to educate me, he said, black people are from here. And he pointed to Africa. I said, dad, but Jamaica's over there. How did our family get from there to there? And then he taught me about the slave trade. And I, and it was from that moment that I needed to know more. I did learn about the horrors of the slave trade but I also really dive deep into learning about Muhammad Ali. And I've read everything on Muhammad Ali just because his um, perspective was so, he was such a visionary, he was, he was so upwardly thinking, he was so proud of himself, so esteemed. Um, so I'd say at that age, my curiosity started to develop and you're starting to see, learn about the balance between the evil and the good and the good in the evil, in the sense that there are, the, the slave trade was awful is the, in my opinion, one of, if not the greatest crimes against humanity in the history of the world. But in very, very dark times, light shines very, very bright. And that's when we start to see individuals like Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, Harriet Tubman, Queen Nanny, Toussaint Louverture shining as bright as they do because they are such sources of, um, of good in such evil times. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Elia, Elia, do you want to ask your question? Sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Do hi. Um, I just wanted to say, um, as like um a future historian myself and studying history, um, I was really impressed how the presentation managed to capture things from the ancient, like ancient Egypt, all the way up into the Windrush. Like I was so impressed how he was able to cover everything in an hour. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, did um, anybody else have a question? Can't see hands. Any more hands while we're here? So in terms of history, um, Elliot, we know that the history within the school system starts with basically with the slave trade. Yeah. And, um, and we know um, being taught it in such a way that it kind of really it feels quite demoralizing to us as as a black community mm. you've just shared with us a wealth of history that goes beyond before and during the slave trade what do you think we can do to actually bring about change yeah so first of all the hero needs to shift the hero story needs to shift because the current hero story is is a lie in a sense that the current hero story is that of the prodigal son. Like, I don't know if you, if you guys know like the biblical story of the prodigal son, the individual who was lost, but now he's found. It's, it's complete nonsense. Essentially what they're saying is that England as a nation was lost, but they eventually found themselves and they found true ethical light, right? Through William Wilberforce and the Clapham boys. It's absolute rubbish. The, the hero story needs to shift. The focus of the hero story needs to go back to the Samuel Sharps, back to the Toussaint Louvertures, the Queen Nannies, the Cecil Fatimas, um, and it's focusing on those heroes. That's that's where it needs to go. In fact, I would even ask, I would even argue that um, Britain needs to shift its hero story of its own people because they spend too much time glamorizing those of the upper classes when, in fact, it was the individuals of the lower middle and the working classes who had far uh, far greater allies to the black struggle than than the upper classes were. But that's testimony to the class system. That's one of the flaws of, of Britain. Yeah, and I, I, on that note, I remember, I recall reading about the workers in the mill up north, I think in York, 
These were very poor workers who actually heard about what was going on in the Caribbean with the slaves and they went on strike. So poor yes. people who actually helped to bring about the end of slavery in the yes. sense that they just refused to work with cotton that came from the Americas or the Caribbean. David uh, Olashoga was fantastic at documenting that. Um, and, and that's also, you know, it's a fantastic point that the British love to talk about the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was essentially a speeding up of the processing of the products which were produced from slave labor, cotton, tobacco, sugar. That's essentially what the Industrial Revolution was. In fact, the reason why the Industrial Revolution happened in the UK is because they didn't actually want it to happen in the Caribbean. They didn't want that money to be made in the Caribbean. They wanted it to be made in British factories. So yeah, 100, I, I, I completely agree. And they should be, you know, they obviously should be uh, given their, their um, time in history for that. Yeah, and it's important to, to, to remember that white people also were on our side. But, you know, they, they, they wanted, they hated this. Mm -hmm. So it's those in power, those yeah. in wealth that were the per 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 perpetrators, weren't they, really? Absolutely. Uh, at, um, William Nibb, if you don't know, I don't know if you guys know about William Nibb. William Nibb was a friend of Samuel Sharp, a fellow Baptist minister, and he was a, a huge campaigner against slavery in England. I think he went on speaker circuits to campaign against it. He, William Nibb is the one who conducted the ceremony of the monster is dead. So I don't know if you guys know in Jamaica about the monster is dead ceremony. So basically at 12 midnight, um, William Nibb and loads of Afro Jamaicans were around a coffin in a church and they start chanting, the monster is dying, the monster is dying, the monster is dying. And they put these slave tools in the coffin. So forms of uh, tools for torture, handcuffs, anything like whips and they lower it into the ground and they seal it and at 12 midnight that's when emancipation happens in 1833 and they chant the monster wow. is dead the monster is dead and they're wow. free yeah wow. William Nibb was the one who conducted that ceremony wow that's amazing so well I, I've just got to thank you so much for sharing with us this morning it was a brilliant um, walkthrough of Pleasure. our struggle Okay. And um, I do hope that you will come back and share with us again in the autumn or the next term. I mean, as I said, this is our penultimate session this year. Um, young people, I'm sorry. I hope you don't mind us hijacking um, your sessions. Um, this was a really important lesson for all of us. And it's really important to, you know, this is why we do what we do on a Saturday, because it is important to be to become more critical in your thinking and having the ability to go away and research and question and not just accept knowledge as fact, but to really start to absorb it, learn it, but go and do your own research and find out what is the truth. You know, what is the truth that is told? So I'm so grateful that we're able to, as a Saturday school, support you along the journeys. Elliot, what's your thought about Saturday schools? Is, is this, should we have more of this? I'm looking to get more involved with Saturday schools because I didn't really hear about Saturday schools until um, I came across um, a few things that Akala um, was, was speaking about and how much of a benefit it was to him growing up. And I would have honestly, growing up, I would have absolutely cherished this. I would have found it absolutely- Me too, true, me too. True to my soul. And um, I mean, it speaks to my soul. And yeah, if, if I can get involved uh, more so in future, please reach out to me, I'd love to do so. Amazing, that's wonderful. And talking about Akala, he was on LBC Radio on Tuesday, just gone. If you want to go back and I play what Akala had to say at, I think it was 11.30 in the morning, his discussion about the Windrush generation is phenomenal. So do go back and visit. Wait, sorry. Um, sorry. Any, um, sorry? Oh, so sorry. I was trying to put my hand up, but my, my, my hand up button is not working. Um, oh, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so, so, yeah, so Elliot, really kind of quickly, um, I, I think history really is, is kind of like so, so um, important for um, our youngsters. And I just think that what, you know, what do you think about um, the current um, situation with knife crime today among young people? Why, why, why do you think that, you know, so many young people are 
stabbing themselves? Do you think it's about identity and, not and why they're doing what? Sorry. You know, so why why a lot of you know you obviously young people. You know, there's a lot of our boys. You know that have taken to, to knife crime and gang. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah. So I've looked at the data, and I, I, for me, you know, you're not you're not seeing people with um, degrees um, or people who live in in um, stable home situations um, stabbing each other. Um, I, I, I treat, as an osteopath, I treat a lot of police officers and I ask them, you know, you tell me what are the biggest correlations that you see to individuals getting involved in knife crime and counting lines. Every single one of them says those who grew up in foster care, those who grew up in the care system, they're the most likely to go into that. Poverty, um, I think that 70% of violent crime in London happens in the, in the top 10% poorest areas. Um, you know, there's, there's so many home stresses, so many uh, emotional stresses that occur with poverty, with poverty, with, um, with unstable home situations. I, I don't think that we can necessarily correlate it. So in fact, I looked at a meta-analysis the other day uh, where they've looked at all the data and they, they couldn't find any correlation between knife crime and, um, and race or religion or anything like that, but they did find a correlation towards poverty. And once again, it's another discussion, but unfortunately our people are a few of the poorest people in, in the UK when it comes to our income. And um, there's multiple reasons for that. We, we weren't able to get off at the same you know, starting post that many other immigrants did for multiple reasons. The concepts of us shaped our, uh, our uh, reality in the UK. So essentially, you know, if, if I am honest, we, we are unfortunately behind when it comes to the upward mobility that a lot of uh, other descendants of immigrants have experienced. But, you know, so uh, to summarize, um, to summarize, murder or gun, um, knife crime or involved in drugs has no correlation to race but it does have a correlation to poverty and unfortunately our people have succumbed to um, more stresses which have caused them to become poorer than say other ethnic minorities yeah, thank you thank you Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time this morning. We appreciate you. We look forward to having you back in future. And yes, we'd be grateful if you'd be more interested in 100%. doing a few more things with the program. So young people, I think it's now just gone for, uh, six minutes past 11. I think we're gonna have a 10 minute break or a nine minute break. We will go straight into our second session. What do you think guys or should Yes, let's go straight into our second sessions. Bye, Elliot. Thank you so much, Elliot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elliot. You've earned a cup of coffee. I will speak to you later. Thank you. Thank you. So, 